Hello, and welcome to another episode of Making Sense of Social Media Podcast. My name is Lori Clausen, and today we have the absolute delight of speaking with Robert Brown. He is a agency owner out of the United States and drops some absolutely amazing value for you today. I can't wait for you to hear all about his take on deeply knowing your customer, content pillars, and lots of other amazing tips. Welcome, Robert. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to those watching and listening today? Sure. My name is Robert Brown. I'm the founder of The Customer Shop. We specialize in helping small to medium-sized businesses find the right customer and turn them into raving fans um, through understanding strategic messaging and uh, technology. That's, I, I, first of all, I love the name of your agency. That's just clever. You know, sometimes easier is better, simpler, you know what I mean? So the customer mm -hmm. shop, that's very indicative of what you do. So I love that. Well, why don't we just dive right into some of the questions I have for you today and sure. so that you can share your experience and expertise. So what are your main goals of creating and distributing content on the different social platforms? And how does that relate in terms of discovering who your ideal customer is? So I'm a really big fan that for established businesses. You take a look at who the customers you love are and you have conversations mm -hmm. with them and understand how they found you. Okay. Um, you know, don't guess, you know, that's like throwing darts in, in the air and, and, you know, not sure where they're going to land. You just ask them, you know, how did, how did you find me and what resonated with you? Right. So that, that is, you know, in the digital world, that parlance is um, voice of the customer. We can get voice of the customer a number of different ways. Um, interviewing is the, the best way, sp specifically open-ended questions um, to just mm. let them talk and listen to them and take lots and lots of notes. If you try to do surveys, they're typically going to be prejudiced to what you're thinking, and they may limit the responses of the customer. So you can't necessarily get the big picture of, you know, what's going on with them and looking at data like Google analytics or whatever analytics tools, you, you, know, you can see where they're going through the funnel. Um, uh -huh. through your content and through your sites and, and, you know, if they do convert, you can kind of, and that's important to figure out where people drop off with where there's a big cliff, but you know, when you're creating content, you really need to think about the customer, right. not, you know, a, a lot of small businesses get caught up in the me, 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 me. I have a bake shop and I make cakes and I make cupcakes and cookies and you should come to me. Not, oh, my daughter's getting married and I, you know, I'm looking for a really special wedding cake. Do, you know, do you make really special wedding cakes? Right. You know, can, can, can you do custom orders? And so you, when you start thinking about the questions that the customer is going to ask mm -hmm. and answer those questions, where they are in their process, it helps them make their decisions better. And so when I think... For those that don't understand, um, I'm going to use a couple of, you know, industry terms to help describe the process. I like to relate it to the homeowner who has a car and the car stops working. Now, they, they probably don't know an awful lot about cars. Most don't. The car just stops working and, and they don't know what to do. And it's like, oh, I have to take it to a mechanic. But if you just move to an area, you're not going to know a mechanic. So how are you going to figure mm -hmm. out which mechanic to go to? Okay. We used to go to the phone book and look at the phone book. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. Google makes it incredibly difficult these days because when you look at their search engine results page, when you type a mechanic in Milwaukee, it's going to have a lot of promoted ads. It's going to have a lot of AI generated content now. Yes. If you look at it, so the first section is going to be the ads. Then it's going to be the AI predicted questions you may be asking. Then it's going to be some videos and then it's going to be the natural search results. And then it's going to go back to the ads again. It's just so complicated. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so understanding who your typical customer is will determine where they go to find that information. Oh, so that's so rich. It, I love that. If you are, say, um, a Gen Xer, an older Gen Xer, 
you're probably on Facebook. Me, me too, right? You're, you're probably on Facebook. Okay. If you are a Gen Z, you are most likely on Instagram. If you are uh, or a Gen Alpha, a Gen Z and Gen Alpha, you're probably on Instagram. You're definitely on TikTok. You may be on Snapchat or, or some of the other direct messaging platforms, but that's where you're going to be. So mm -hmm. if you're expecting, you know, a Gen Zer to come to you and you don't have content where they happen to be, they won't ever find you. There was actually a study done by Google that specifically said Gen Z, when looking for restaurants, will first look on Instagram to see what the restaurant looks like and what the rating is on Instagram before they do anything else. And then they're going to go to TikTok and see if any influencers have done any content on the restaurant there as well. They're not going to Google first. Yeah. Wow. Now, if you sell products, 80% of all products, the search begins where? Do you know? Well, I mean, social in general. I'm going to say TikTok. Uh-uh. Amazon. No. Oh. Indeed, absolutely. Of all products, the search begins on Amazon before they wow. go look elsewhere. I mean, I do it myself. I should have considered that. And so if there's actually this really cool app called Libra. Uh, F and it's mm -hmm. essentially a Amazon for audiobooks connected to local bookshops. Oh, wow. That's cool. So you can actually go buy the book from a local bookshop and support them as opposed to supporting Audible. Um, mm -hmm. So going back to, you know, who your customer is, understanding where they're going to be will help them help you be in front of them. That's that's the first step, right? So you have to be what I like to call findable. If you're not findable, yeah. you're not going to get, the, you know, the engagement. Absolutely. Then you have to consider where they are in that stage of the process. Mm -hmm. So the stage of the process is my car broke down. I need to find a mechanic. Then I need to figure out what's wrong with my car. And so that is part of the, the discovery or research phase of the, the conversion funnel. And so you have to have content out there that helps them understand what may be going on and why they may want to consider you. So it's in their, their information gathering stage. Once they've gathered enough information, they're going to move to the next step where they're going to make a decision and they're going to compare a couple of choices and decide which one they're going to go to. Now, right. the criteria they use for those choices are going to be user generated content, reviews that you've gotten and the content that you provide yourself. So mm -hmm. they have enough information to make an informed choice and they feel you come across this trustful enough to them that they will come to you, right? Mm -hmm. That you don't have that, that friction out there. Then they'll come into you. Right. But it's it's through those steps. And so what social media has done now, social media is now a discovery. So it, it combines a couple of segments of the funnel. It's a discovery tool. It is a information gathering tool. And mm -hmm. it is a decision assistance tool. And you have mm -hmm. to have those pieces of content there to help them walk through those stages. Right. Yeah. Unless, unless, you know, my daughter's car breaks down and she says, daddy, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> then, then, you know, I'm going to tell her what to do. And so, yes. you know, she'll bypass some of those steps, but usually that doesn't happen. And so, you know, when you think about the content that I'm create that I would create, it's like, okay, what is my service? What questions do customers have about my service that I can answer for them? And have I published content that answers those questions? How do we encourage, this is fantastic guidance. Thank you so much, Robert. How, how do we encourage the local bakery or the local, you know, cake maker who is doing this all on their own? to not be nervous or afraid of this process? Like how do we make it feel doable and sustainable? Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so my wife owns a dance studio and she does not have the time mm -hmm. to, to record this, but our daughter does. So our okay. daughter comes in I, and we have a couple of students that help as well. They record the content and give the content to my daughter and, and she will make the little clips and upload them. That was last year. 
this year, AI can help you do that. Oh, keep talking. So AI, now there's a couple of tools out there for podcasts as well, that mm -hmm. you can actually just take your clip, dump it in there, and it can actually edit it, clip it, and, and prepare it for you so you can then upload it. Mm -hmm. um, so you could conceivably have a high resolution camera on your countertop. You could have one that's attached to you just, um, you know, going about your daily business. Right. Um, you know, some of the content that, that people really love is seeing the story, seeing the background, the authenticity yes. of who you are and why you are, mm -hmm. because they want to support that. They yeah. don't want to support the big corporate machine that has all the money. They yes. want to support the little local guy that has a really unique and interesting story. Right. Yeah. There's, there's heart and love and quality built into what you're doing. Oh, I love that so much. Heart, love, quality. Anybody who doesn't understand that is, is missing the boat for sure. I really, as a social media coach, I talk with a lot of people who are like terrified to get on camera. So, you know, what, what do you say to that person? Um, I think a lot of people are afraid of the negative feedback that some have heard, you know, some of the celebrities that I've heard talk about social media. They have just openly said, I just can't read it. I just do my thing. Yeah. And it's just there for my customers to, you know, or my fans to, to engage with. And so you don't have to engage with them regularly, but okay. you do have to, but you have to help them find you and have to help them have a reason to come to you. Just because you're there, you know, it's not the field of dreams. Build it yeah. and they will come. Such a good movie though, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a good movie. But, you know, the thing behind the movie is that there's the invisible hand assisting mm. all of this, right? Mm -hmm. we, we don't have the invisible hand in real life, you know? So I give the example of somebody driving down Main Street and there's 12 coffee shops. How do you know which one to stop at and why? And, you know... Some of them are going to have those little blue and white Greek cups that just have the big brawn coffee makers that are mediocre at best. Some are going to be the little artisanal shop that roasts and grinds the coffee there and is really passionate about what they do. Some are going to be maybe a chain like Dunkin' Donuts or, you know, one of the other ones mm -hmm. or Starbucks. And, you know, if you don't give them a reason to stop there, they won't. Yeah. Something I often encourage people, those that are really nervous to be seen on video and, and even just images is you just, you have to practice, practice until you feel comfortable. And I mean, if, if you want to succeed with social, it's just part of something that has to happen. So you, know, you don't always have to be on camera mm. to have social media presence. Absolutely. You, you could film the process that is yeah. just you talking in the background, you know, like, Hey, I'm, I'm making uh, a sourdough starter today. And you know, the camera is on a tripod over here, watching you make the sourdough star starter or like a paper shop. When I was yeah. in college, there was, there was this really cool paper shop that made all their own paper there. And you know, you like go and watch paper? them. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. So they would actually make the paper there and then they would put designs on the paper. So they had this, this giant printing screen printing yeah. process. They would put the designs on the paper and, you know, for them to come up with those designs, I mean, it was just, you know, this handcrafted shop. I mean, you know, like yeah. Etsy, the precursor to like what Etsy, Etsy would be. So, yeah. um, but in, if you didn't know it was there, you never would have stopped there. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so, and that's where understanding your customers is really important because just because it's important to you doesn't necessarily mean it's important to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, one of the things I see right now is restaurants. A lot of restaurants are struggling. And the reason they're struggling is the average folks are looking at the cost to go out for a meal. Mm -hmm. My wife and I just stopped at a local restaurant the other day. We had one appetizer between the two of us, um, a bowl of pasta and a sandwich. 
and two glasses of wine. And that was 80 bucks. That's ridiculous. Yeah. With our current reality. Yeah. And and then on top of that, you have the entire tipflation peaks, right? So mm. in the past, people were perfectly happy to get 15%. And now you have servers saying, hey, I can't afford this. You need to tip me 25%. And the restaurant's putting any, you know, 18 to 30% tip calculations on there and some of them are then adding surcharges like kitchen surcharges or covid surcharges or and you know they're wondering why why don't i have as many customers as i had five years ago Mm -hmm. because people the the average folks can't afford to go out for 80 dollars a meal yeah they try to justify well it's only 15 dollars for a hamburger what you know and so if you understand your customer you'll understand where their pain point is and and target that specifically so if you are in fact a restaurant and you know that you're in a working class neighborhood even if they only go out once to eat once a week to eat you know that they can't afford three dollars a month on eating out once a week so you need to uh, adapt your menu to provide more cost-friendly options to sustain them and you know same thing with other businesses it's it's you know you can have uh the affluent customer so i used to work for aig the private client group and it was Mm -hmm. the the high net worth ultra wealthy folks these it's crazy how wealthy they were one of the customers wanted to have a dinner party in new york they had a monet in london so we went there packed up the monet in london shipped it over to new york installed it for their dinner party then after the dinner party packed it back up and shipped it back to london oh i just you just exploded my brain i don't even understand <laughs> these these are people Level of wealth. we had a customer that had a car collection 600 cars i mean it makes oh. it may it may very well have been like jay leno but you know <laughs> we we don't understand how wealthy some of these people really are And, you know, those folks, you don't reach on social media. They're not there. That's what I was just thinking too. You know, they, their, their staff is there. Mm -hmm. So you're understanding again, who you're targeting. So you're not reaching out to the wealthy owner of the home. You're actually reaching out to the house manager or the chef or the cook who needs to go buy the, the ingredients for them. Right. And. You know, I think that's where, you know, really embracing what that means. So typically it's not one customer for a business. Mm. There's, there are terms that people have thrown around avatar or persona. Mm -hmm. And each business is going to have a variety of them. And you need to be able to provide that content for each one of them. So Mm. you start with what your largest persona is. Right. Um, you know, let's say that you have um, a little local cafe that is near a school and after school, a bunch of the kids come by the cafe and they all buy cookies, right? Yeah. So in that instance, who would your target customer be? Yeah, the kids. Would it? Or would it be the parents who are giving the money for the cookies? Oh, good point. You know, so thinking about, it's, it's kind of like a little puzzle. You know, so think about what would you do? What would your friends do? How would they find out about this? And what what would entice them? So in this case, if we're talking parents, it's most likely on Facebook. So having content on Facebook, pictures, it doesn't even have to be videos. It can, it can just right. be pictures. And talking about here's a healthy after school snack that kids can get on the way home that you know, will help sustain them until dinner time and show pictures of the cafe that it's safe and friendly and inviting. And the parents will go, Oh, that's really cool. Let's, you know, take them there. And then you can branch off yeah. because once they then know about it, then you can start talking to them about the ancillary services that you may offer. It's like, Oh, yeah. um, do birthday parties. So we'll cater your birthday party or make your cake or, or if right. you're a bridal shower or if you're having a baby shower. And so that's that one persona. Right. So you can really base your content strategies around, I, I, you know, this is another sort of um, industry term or is content pillars. Uh You could, you could technically strategize your content pillars around each persona. Yes. As, 
as opposed to that. And you honestly, that's the first time I've ever even heard of this. So this is mind blowing for even me. And I've been doing this a really long time. So, you know, social media and digital, the whole digital space, we're all constantly learning. But that is brilliant. I, I absolutely love that. I think that most small business owners could really wrap their heads around the ability to do that as opposed to having content pillars such as engagement or, you know, conversion or, you know, this and that and the other thing. So, wow, that's brilliant, Robert. If you really think about sitting down and having coffee with somebody and having that conversation with them, that's what the social media is really all about. It's having that conversation with them and providing them the mm -hmm. information that they find engaging, interesting, and, and helpful for them to move through their, their process. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating when I hear so many business owners get overwhelmed with content because they think, oh, they're telling me I need to make silly dance videos, or I need to have the latest music, or I need scripts, or mm. I need, I need, I need, I need. No, you don't. If you actually think about, think about an individual person. I mean, that's one of the things about like broadcasts. They talk about you, you pretend that there's somebody directly across from you having a conversation with you and talk right. to them, talk to that one person. And it, it suddenly makes it so much more manageable. Oh, this is fantastic. Well, along those lines, I'd love your input on the great debate of quality versus quantity when it comes to creating content. There's so many industry experts and gurus out there saying you have to produce 50 pieces of content a day across all the social platforms. And I mean, I think I know what you're going to say, but I still want to hear your your take on this, you know, quality versus quantity. It, it really is a, a huge debate because there's still lots of noise out there of quantity yeah. is what matters. And it, ooh, I don't <laughs> so I would suggest that you really consider what the pundits objective is. Mm -hmm. Their objective is to get as many eyeballs on their content to get sponsorship. Mm, yeah. So they're going to continue to say, Hey, I'm successful because I have lots of eyeballs and I have sponsors and I am yeah. part of the TikTok creative group. And so because I have more eyeballs, I'm getting a little stream from that. And because I get a million views on a video, I get money from that on, on YouTube. Mm. Yeah. But their objective is completely different than yours. Right. I like the analogy of you said noise. There's a lot of noise out there. Mm -hmm. So it's like going into a Def Leppard concert and screaming at the top of your lungs. Does <laughs> anybody hear you? I'm sorry. That is fantastic. No. Oh, that's hilarious. But or when, when we were much younger and if we happen to have gone to a nightclub, right? So when you go to a nightclub yeah. and, and the music's pounding and you can't even hear yourself think, but you see somebody that you're interested in, and so you walk over to them and you start interacting with that one person. You may not hear their voice, but you're kind of reading lists and, and having this communication. Now, is that one to many or is that one to one? Definitely one to one. Yeah. That's what you need to consider for your content. And so yeah. when you're creating your content, so you ask the question, do I think quantity versus quality? I think it's the quality. So does mm -hmm. what you put out there resonate with your audience? Now, if you are a local shop, you are not trying to sell to the, the entire United States. You're not trying to sell to the entire world. You're not trying to get somebody from Chicago to come buy your stuff. You're trying to yeah. get the mom and pop couple from down, you know, down the block to stop at your shop and buy something. When you start engaging with them and creating that, that engagement, then they start talking about you and they, and maybe they post some user generated content about you. And then that's where the viral nature of, of social media comes into play because they do that work for you. When people are passionate about what you do, they're going to post positive reviews. They're going to share stuff that you've done that made their life better. And then other people hear about it and you continue to focus on the individuals. Such great advice. Oh. I love this. Well, my next question to you, 
Robert is as someone who spends time in the skies soaring around, what is your 10,000 foot view of the importance of analytics and determining how things are effective? Or is that even important? Depends on your organization. Okay. So I love data. Mm -hmm. I'm neurodiverse. So I have ADHD. I, I have dyslexia and I was a Wall Street trader and I lived and breathed by data. But the problem yeah. with data, um, the problem with anything for, for a lot of people is what I like to call the trifecta of fun, the psychological okay. term. Um, the trifecta of fun is motivated reasoning, cognitive dissonance, and I can't remember the third one right this second, but it, essentially you're looking for data to support your view. Right. And so with cognitive dissonance is when, when you feel uncomfortable, when somebody presents an idea to you uh -huh. and it makes you feel uncomfortable because it goes against everything that you think or believe. Mm -hmm. And so you suddenly get very defensive and you're like, I'm going to go find data to prove my point. Mm -hmm. And so when you go looking for it, lo and behold, you find it and you've proved your point. <laughs> Did you ever watch Ted Lasso? Oh, I loved it many times, actually. <laughs> okay. So in the dart scene with Rupert. Yes. Oh, so good. When he talks about don't be judgmental, be curious. Mm -hmm. So when you go to look at data, you have to have an open mind. You can't mm. walk into it and think, I'm trying to prove this point. No. Right. You go in there with your eyes open and just kind of see the stories, because there will yeah. be many of them, the stories that it's telling you. So when I go and take a look at data, I like to call it data wandering. I will just That's wander. cute. I like that. I will wander through the data for a while. And then I'll put it down and come back to it and see kind of what paths, what, what tales it, it, it provides to me, because it's never going to be clear cut 100%. It's this. There's, yeah. there's going to be some weird, yeah. little funky things going on. And so you need to figure out what those mean. So earlier I had mentioned that um, when you're looking at data through a funnel, you know, conversion funnel, you're asking top of the funnel is going to be the awareness. Have they discovered who I am? Are they coming and visiting my page? Okay, great. They've, that's eyeballs. So when you look at some social media like TikTok and you have a video, you'll typically see a very large drop off very quickly. They saw uh -huh. your video, it didn't engage them and they left and you get this cliff. So, you know, you're up here and break down. And so that is interesting feedback for you to understand, okay, why did they drop off so quickly? Did, if you're at that stage in your organization where you really want to have better engagement with your customers and you're, you're looking at the data to try to understand what that engagement looks like, then you start taking a look at that, you know, how long do they, they interact with my content? Do they share my content? Do they con comment on my content? And are the comments positive? Like one of the things that I do mm. for my, my wife's studio for her TikTok account is all of the comments have to be approved before I let Ooh, them through. Good. Even on TikTok? On TikTok. Absolutely. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. That's, oh, yeah. So that's yeah. brilliant. So nobody's allowed to con comment. They can like but no one's allowed to comment on her stuff without me approving it. Right. Why? That's good. Because yeah. most of the people looking at dance content are other girls and teen girls can be really, really nasty. And the content that we show for the dance studio is this is the real story of what beginning dancers look like. They are not perfect. They are making mistakes, but they are out there trying and exploring the art and, and trying to grow as people in the art. Yeah. And so mistakes happen. It's not perfect, but it's a journey. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the, the unrealistic view that so much content out there, like the, I think you've seen the, um, the beauty influencers that always look like they have perfect bodies. And, but then they start to realize the problem of that. And so they would show, Hey, here's the angle and here's the lighting. This is what I really look like. I don't have ripped abs all the time. I actually have uh -huh. a little bit of that, but I'm holding in my stomach and I'm, you know, 
And so <laughs> yep. showing the reality of the authenticity, the reality of what it, what it's about, um, yep. and then disallowing those negative comments or deleting them. So yep. we, we have had people make negative comments on our Facebook and Instagram, and I delete them because the dance studio is all about positivity. We're yeah. encouraging our young people and they won't continue to grow if they feel that they're being um, criticized. Yeah, criticized and judged and yeah. Wow, that's, I, I like that strategy. Plus it saves time and energy and just heartache <laughs> when it comes to, because inevitably those types of negative comments often turn into big arguments and just causes so much havoc. So that's a good strategy. I, I actually really like that. It's challenging because the, the global nature of TikTok, I've had comments from in Cyrillic. So trying to, mm -hmm. which is uh, like Russian. Oh. So trying <laughs> to get that into yeah. like a, a translator and then back out into English. So I understand what they've actually said. Right. Can be a little challenging. Same thing with like Greek and Italian and Spanish. Um, so right. I have to, because you can't copy and paste in TikTok. On yes, Facebook and Instagram, right. you can't. But on TikTok, you can't. So, you know, I'll see it on TikTok and I'll type it in there and, you know, wait for the English response and go, oh, they're being negative. Okay, delete. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. That's one thing I like. I think it's on Facebook. They You can have automatic or like the translation option yep. is right there inside of the comment section. So yep. that's really nice. Wow. That's, I really like that. Well, Robert, I have one more question for you today before I let you go. And that is your take on the use of, and we've addressed this a little, really leaning on people's or leaning into people's emotion and, and using that in storytelling um, for like actual stories on the different platforms. How do you feel those are or are not effective and, and worthwhile. I love storytelling, but it has to be honest from the heart. Mm, authentic. Yeah, it absolutely has to be authentic because they will smell fake and or worse if they believe that you've been authentic and then they find out later not, on that you're not, ooh, you will ooh. be canceled. <laughs> yes, so you, fast. You will be canceled so fast and it, <laughs> it's just... So I don't know if you've ever seen the influencer, um, Keith Lee. Yes. Okay. I love Keith Lee and he is Me so too. and he is just out there, you know, praising his family and, and thanking his public. And, you know, you follow that story because it's, it's, and he's, he talks about the story about each individual restaurant that he goes to. Yeah. So it draws you in. Yeah. Right. Completely. It gives you a reason. So that that's the challenge with like Instagram, with the original Instagram, as opposed to mm -hmm. the reels. With the original Instagram, it's a picture. Now, it used to be that a picture was worth a thousand words, but AI mm -hmm. has certainly changed that. Mm -hmm. And so you really can't tell what's real. But now with, with the videos, you know, you can, you get a better feel for the emotion and the, and the story behind it. But it, it doesn't have to be so difficult as writing a script and acting it. Just be yeah. yourself because yeah, that will absolutely. resonate with somebody. Again, thinking about talking to one person. Yeah. And knowing your that one person intimately, like knowing that that's who you want and need to serve. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Robert, this has been such a delight. I'm so grateful that you spent some time with us today. Why don't you tell those watching and listening where they can find you on the internet and or your socials? Sure. You can find me at thecustomershop.com. Beautiful. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Thank you again so much. This has been absolutely wonderful and quite mind blowing, to be honest. I can't wait to get it out to the public. So thank awesome. you thank again. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Wow. What an absolutely amazing episode. When it's time for you to look for your very own social media marketing coach, please come check out the Marketing Mentor. It's it's a group coaching program intended for small business owners. It's a six week program. We meet once per week for six weeks. And I walk you through everything you need to know from A to Z or A to Z for the small business owner. Check out all the information in the description box below. Thanks again for watching this episode and I'll see you next time.